we'll do a, a recap on some of the things from last week. Um, it is online, you could watch it, and there's some PowerPoint on it. Andrew's done a great job there with it. And we'll do a quick recap. We'll show you some of the quick PowerPoints, and we'll take it on from there. Could I say that we're going to do another night next week on this? The reason being, there's so much. What I want to do is show you these uh, kingdoms are alive and well in other forms even today than in the day of Daniel, but they're alive and well, as it were, in our day today. You think of even where we're going to bring you up, God willing, next week. Maybe do one more before our first year anniversary on the, the first Sunday in May, which will be here one year. Uh, we don't know. We'll maybe do a, another week after that. We're hearing much about Syria at the minute and Russia. And all of these things are mentioned in Scripture. Uh, I put a, a little post up of uh, Damascus shall be as a ruinous heap. People are going, where did that come from? It's never happened to Damascus yet. And it's a prophecy yet to be fulfilled. So what I may do, if I get this finished next week, is do the following week. Show you the historical context of Damascus the scriptural context, and then right up to this present day. And God willing, we maybe do that, and it will, uh, I'll maybe put some PowerPoint in. It just puts a lot of, uh, I don't do the PowerPoints. I give the pictures to Denise or Andrew, and they're gracious and kind and help me that way. But we hear of uh, this, um, these poisonous gases and Russia and who, who has done it, who hasn't done it. And I'll be honest, the... The latest one that we've heard in, in Syria, um, you know, the book of Ezekiel talks about putting hooks in the jaws of Russia. Now, the word Russia isn't there, but it talks about, the Lord says, I'll put hooks in your jaws as though you're putting a fish in. And that's what's happening. Britain coming out of the European Union. That's not by accident. That's by divine providence. You know, when we voted on the, uh, on the, the, the 23rd of May, um, that day when we actually did vote. Um, do you know that there was parts of London that were very heavily populated by liberal or else those who would vote to remain? And the Lord sent a mighty deluge of rain, and a lot of them couldn't get out to vote. <laughs> didn't happen anywhere else, just in their neighborhood. Now, when you tell me that is not the Lord, you tell me what is. The, there's actually photographs, if you look, Google it, I'm sure they may be still there, where the rain is, was so deep, it was right over the bonnets of their cars. And he did it for the day of the voting, uh, that they couldn't get out. And, of course, we all thought, even Nigel Farage himself, he had actually thought, well, they'd lost the vote. And by the time of the end of the day, well, we were all rejoicing because God had moved on our behalf and done a wonder and a work for Britain to come out of the European Union. Now, Russia being involved, whether he's in, they're involved or not, with these gases and these nerve agents, and whether this be the idea or not, I have my own ideas, and I don't know why I want to share them with you, maybe some other time. But I don't put all the blame on Russia. I believe there's other agents behind the scene. And they're trying, as it were, at this time, to say to Britain, you've voted for Brexit, you are leaving, but here's the problem. You're lost without the European Union, not only financially, which we're not. Um, we are not lost whatsoever. Actually, our finances are starting to go on the rise again already, even though they don't want to report it on the news. And yet they're saying, but stay with us, for we will protect you. When there's a nerve agent was in, in England, and the Russian spy uh, happened to take Ellen, his daughter, with it, the first thing they said was this. They come out, the European Union, and they said, we will expel the diplomats when you want us to expel them. And they did, some of the diplomats of Russia, out of the European Union. And it was, see, you need us. You cannot do without us. And now, the European Union haven't got an army, they say. But you see, the problem is then, how could they protect us if we're outside the European Union and Russia, this big colossal bear, is to come against us? How could they protect us without an army? Well, here's the thing. That's why they want us to stay, because they want an army. 
They want the United States of Europe. They want the United Army. They want to take away our sovereignty. They have taken away the sovereignty, as it were, if they can as much as possible, of Her Majesty the Queen. They have made Westminster Parliament more like a borough council of the European Union. It's like they've put the fist in and got it out the powers, left some over that we think we're governing ourselves. And now that is, the, that is a big problem. So they're saying this is all linking together. Now we're looking at Syria and the nerve agents that were used in Syria. Here's a little thing. We haven't got into the word yet. Listen, here's a little thing just because we will touch on some of these things. There was a man called Fritz Haber. Who's ever heard of Fritz Haber? No, but Fritz Haber, yeah. Fritz Haber was a German Jew. In the late 1800s, coming into 1890, 98, around that time. And his family were all Jewish, living in Germany. Well, actually, they were in Prussia. Prussia was Poland and Germany at the time. And his city now is where he grew up. And Bayer, I think, is the name of it, was, is now in Poland. And Franz Haber became, uh, if you want, a, a German citizen because of the way the boundaries changed with the Prussian War and so on. But what happened was he became uh, known as, if you want, he won a Nobel Peace Prize, but he became known as, as the father of the, the cyanide gases. I can't remember the name of all the gases. He actually learned how to make those. And he learned to make them that they may be used in the second battle of Ypres in Belgium in the First World War. Now, here's the tragic thing. That man came and rejected Judaism and turned to Lutheranism. Now, I don't know what that means, why he was saved or not, or he just went to the denomination. If it was a denomination, then he's not saved. But if he came to Christ and followed their will, we'll leave that with God. But that man, he ended up that... the very gases that he produced. And a lot of the stuff actually on the better side, if, if I can call it the better side, uh, and the more popular side was that it's used in nearly all of our food, the very agents that he was able to break up, that we needed for our food and our production of food. Hence he won a Nobel Peace Prize. But do you know, he became, uh, linked himself more to the German uh, nationality and rejected more of his Jewish background, became a Lutheran, thought him and his family were safe, but by the Second World War, his family were taken and gassed by the gases that he had produced from before the First World War. Now, though those nerve agents are what is being used and derived from across the world, all of them. So there's a whole conglomerate of stuff now that's all coming together. I would like to tell you more, but I want to get into the word. But we are looking at these kingdoms. All that's happening is all in Scripture. It tells us in the Word. And if you stay uh, faithful to us in this teaching until next week at least, we're going to bring you not only from Daniel chapter 2 into Daniel 7. We're looking at it tonight. We're going to bring you into the book of Revelation. And we're going to show you the link, even the very metals that are mentioned, the very animals and beasts that are mentioned. We're going to show you how it's in the very uh, political scene that today. We'll show you how it's in the monetary system today, how it's in the ecclesiastical powers of the world as well. And we're going to look at all of these things. So turn now to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. I, I know this stuff, but it's good for I refresh myself every time I study it again to write it. I have, a, I have quite a number of, if you want, sermon teachings on this, but I never just take it down. I always rewrite because God reveals more or, or something I left out the last time. And so, believe it or not, if you were to look at my notes, look, we've got 12 pages so far. We haven't even got past the first. <laughs> well, maybe we get into the second, you know. And, and so there's a lot there. I'm going to try and keep it as, uh, as tight as I can, although... Bear with me. Daniel chapter 2 for our first reading this evening. Daniel chapter 2. Verse 31. Daniel is interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. We were here last week. Let's go again. He interprets the dream and he tells him the dream and then he interprets it. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image, this excellent image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee. And the form thereof was terrible. Now note what the image looks like. And the form thereof was terrible. This image, his head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet of iron and part of clay. 
Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Notice the very descriptive manner, very important for the days that we live in, even today and what has happened in time past. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together. Notice these kingdom times are all like hundreds of years between them. And yet there's the thread of it right through from the head of gold. They're broken in pieces together. So the mysteries that are in the golden head as we look at come right down through the other kingdoms, right to the feet, from the head to the feet. It's like your head tells your feet to move. And it's the same as these mystery Babylon religions and faiths where it tells, the head of it tells the mystery religions of today to move the feet of them. Notice again, and the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold was broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. Notice that, no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the great image became a mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Now notice what he says in verse 37. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven hath he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Oh, thou art this head of gold. Now, I'm going to show you our first one that we looked at last week. Can I just have the, the PowerPoint up, please? Notice he says to, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, thou art this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, thou art this head of gold. Now, I notice we showed you last week how uh, the kingdom of Israel, the 12 tribes were divided into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom of the house of Israel, they had their capital city in, uh, in uh, Samaria. And you can see that in Samaria here. That is Israel. They become known as the house of Israel. They become known as Joseph. They become known as Ephraim. Ephraim is the youngest son of Joseph. They become known as Ephraim. Ephraim means fruitful. Joseph is a fruitful boy whose branches have run over a well. That happens prophetically to his descendants. Then the southern kingdom becomes known as the house of Judah. Judah is where we get the name Jew from. We looked at that last week too. And then Jerusalem is where the godly kings, well, not all were godly, but that's where the chosen king line came from. This one here, they went, uh, the house of Israel, they went and they played the hearted, as it were, with other nations around them and so they were taken away captive into uh, by the Assyrians up over the Dariel Pass and the Caucasus Mountains that's where you get the word Caucasian from that's where you why you're called the Caucasian because we derive from the Caucasus Mountains and so notice this then we can go again here is the two exiles here is the house of Israel and then going up north and this is the house of Judah. This is about 500 miles around here. And here they go past Babylon into Susa, right across into what would be today Iran, right across that. And of course they went around this because this is the fertile crescent. This is where Father Abraham came from and came right down into what is known as Canaan land today or the Holy Land or the land of Israel in later times. Between this, this uh, being carried away, the house of Israel, and here the house of Judah being carried away, we find there is at least 120 years between the carrying away of these two kingdoms. Here is the house of Israel. It's an artist's map of where they had went. They had lost their way, lost their names, and they changed their names and became other names here. Now notice for future reference, maybe in the next week, the names, the Alme, the Heruli, the Ostrogoth, the Lombards, the Burgundians, the Franks, and then we have the Physigoths and the Sueve. Notice all of those names, for they're very important when it comes to the fall of the pagan Roman Empire. That is the legs of iron that we have read about. That's very important because they are the ones who sacked, attacked and sacked Rome. And, of course, then that was the deadly wound that happened 
to the pagan Roman Empire. And then that deadly wound was healed, and out of that came the papal Roman Empire. Okay, so keep your eyes on that and remember those names if you can. Here is an artist's impression. The head of gold, belly and thigh, or the arms and thigh, uh, chest of silver. Then we have the brass, the legs of iron. So this is where we were uh, looking at last week. We also looked at how God would send forth his kingdom. He called Abraham, as we said, out of the Ur of the Chaldees. Abraham became a family. He called a family. He said unto Israel, You have I only known of all the families of the earth. Now, God knows everyone, but he means in an intimate fashion. He was showing himself through that family. And then that family became a people when they grew and they ended up in Egypt. That people became a nation when they came out of Egypt into Canaan land. And when they were in Canaan land, they became a kingdom. Because then we have, of course, Saul was the first one, but God's choice was David. And we went back and showed you there, David had Solomon. Solomon had different wives that they were not meant to marry into. And so God would take the kingdom from him, but not in Solomon's day. It would be in Solomon's son's day. Now Solomon's son was called Rehoboam. And he is the one where the split that we showed you of the kingdom came. And of course, Jeroboam was the one who took the northern kingdom. So this is an artist's impression. The northern kingdom are carried away north around 120 or so years later. The, other, the, the house of Judah, the southern kingdom, are carried into Babylon. And then in Babylon, we find Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He is the king of Babylon. And that's where we have the head of gold. Okay, is everyone with me? All right. I'm trying to take my time. I'm trying to take my time. So the, 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 the southern kingdom of Judah are now in Babylon. The king of Babylon has a dream. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Daniel, who's from Judah, the captives that were taken away into Babylon, those captives now, like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and different ones are there. And because he has the dream, it is what we have read here. Daniel says, this is what your dream is. You saw an image. It had a head of gold. And they went through the silver and the bronze and the iron and the feet part of iron, part of clay. So in our reading... We are here, he says, King Nebuchadnezzar, thou art this head of gold. Now he says in verse 35, at the end of it, he speaks of a stone that smote the image and the mountain became and filled the whole earth. That stone starts with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel. The two kingdoms, the separation, the kingdom of the house of Israel going westward, settling across the western and the if you want the wilderness, as they called it, and no one is of Europe at the time. And then we have the southern kingdom of Judah, where we get the name Jew from, going into Babylon. And from there, Jesus would come when they are released. We're going to look at the release in a moment. This is very important because all of this links up to what's happening in the earth today. People miss it. People miss it. You, you, there's churches who reject it. They don't know it. They don't study it. But yet it's such a blessing. It is such a real plan of God in the earth today that it's so important. Now, this is what we, we see. So if you look at uh, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, you can read it when you go home from verse 36 on down. So he calls Nebuchadnezzar the head of gold. He tells him that there will come an inferior kingdom, which will be silver, the silver kingdom, and other kingdoms will be the bronze kingdom, and then the next king would be an iron kingdom. And he describes, and we haven't time to read through them. And then when you come down to verse 45, he says, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. Notice, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. This isn't a man-made kingdom now. This is a different kingdom than all of these kingdoms. This stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. This stone kingdom begins with Abraham. And it climaxes with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This stone kingdom is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not man-made, but the true kingdom of God is through the Spirit of God. And the true kingdom of God is not like any other kingdom. And it comes and it's going to smash, as it were, on the feet. So we're at the feet tonight. You're at the feet. You and I sit at the feet of Jesus in the Spirit. But we in time are at the feet of this image. 
of iron and clay. Okay, so if you can imagine, this brings us right through time and kingdoms that would come around this area. And then it starts to go westward with the Roman Empire and so on. But we'll break this down in a moment. So the kingdom is uh, cut out without hands and it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, and the silver, and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. So now he says there's a coming kingdom and it's going to smash all of these kingdoms. And of course, we are waiting for that kingdom to come this evening. Not that it's coming this evening, but we're waiting for it to come. We're waiting this evening. Now, when we go into Daniel chapter 3, the Nebuchadnezzar, who is the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar, he takes that literally and he puts up a big, uh, a, 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 an idol of gold and tells everyone to worship it. He says, you worship it, for this is you worshiping me. You're worshiping what I say to worship when I say to worship it. And so he puts it up. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they're called, are thrown into the fiery furnace because they won't worship at this idol. And you see, you can even see these traits coming through even today. Remember all these metals are all from the feet, smashes them all together. The trait of this is today. This trait is not only idolatrous worship it speaks of, but it speaks of people who will get you to worship, want you to worship how they say you should worship. The government, the very, uh, the very institutions that are now being set up and all of the groups who tell us you can't worship like that, you can't believe like that, you must do as we say and do, you must go our way, you must say that everybody's all inclusive. And once you start hearing of inclusiveness and political correctness, you believe it that you're listening to neo-Marxism. That's all you're listening to. You're being brainwashed on television. You're being brainwashed by the media that you're going to accept all of this for this is new world order. It's a, a one-world government, and it's brainwashing you from a young age as children right up to now. You and I are to be very uh, uh, astute that we understand the word of God in these last days because this enemy... This is satanic. We're going to look at this. It's all from Satan. And give me to next week and I'll bring you further in. So stay with me. Notice, so then he makes an idol. It's like a big needle, like Cleopatra's needle if you want. And he makes that and they don't worship and you know, they throws them in the fiery furnace and God keeps them safe. When you get to chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar eats, the Lord smites him to the ground and he's eating grass like a cow. God brings the enemy down. And because he was trying to get God's people to worship another way, there's something to take heart in and rejoice that even though things are happening, God is still on the throne and God is still in control. Yeah, Notice this, no matter what the government say, no matter what is pressed upon you, no matter the fear tactics that they give, God is still in charge, brothers and sisters. It may look different, it may look something else, but our God is sovereign on the throne and he is sending his son again soon and he's going to smash the whole lot of it and you and i will rise to meet the lord in the air who are saved and blood washed and we will be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye and we will return with him to rule and reign for a thousand years hallelujah praise the lord blessed be the name of the lord that is the stone kingdom daniel saw made of god not made of man, not of religion. I don't care what your religion is. I don't care what denomination you say you belong to, whether you're Protestant or Catholic or Hindu or Muslim and Jew or whatever you are. It's in Christ and in Christ alone that we must be found at the coming of the Lord. So are you saved? That's the main thing. Are you saved tonight? Notice it reminds us in Revelation 19, when the angel said to John, John was overwhelmed with the heavenly vision and he fell down to worship and it wasn't the Lord. It was the angel he was falling before. And the angel even says, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, everything about prophecy should point to Christ. He is the one who is giving the word from the beginning. He is the one who is speaking to the prophets, speaking through the prophets. It's Christ 
pre-Bethlehem, before he came as a man, it is the Lord Jesus. He's given the word. Now he's carrying the word out. And he says, keep to the word for I'm coming back again. Worship none other but to worship God. Listen to what Volverd said. He says, this means that prophecy at its very heart is designed to unfold the beauty, of, the beauty and loveliness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Prophecy should always point to Christ. Hawking, he said, any teaching of prophecy that takes our minds and hearts away from him, that is from the Lord Jesus, is not being properly communicated. You see, today, I'm sick and tired of hearing prophecy teachers talk about the Antichrist, the Antichrist. Listen, there is no uh, definite article, the Antichrist. There's none in Scripture. It just says there are many Antichrists. That's the spirit of Antichrist. There's no definite article, and they link the man of sin with the Antichrist. It doesn't say that. It says there is many Antichrists. Now, I notice Daniel chapter 2 and verse 35. It says of these kingdoms at the coming of Christ, it says, And when the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold was broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. Notice the words. Now, remember, Daniel is the shut book. The angel says, Shut up the book until the last or until another time. Revelation of John, he says, open this and write it for the time will be from hereafter. It's shortly to come to pass. So Daniel closes it. John opens it. Does that make sense to you? So we notice in the book of Revelation at the end time, when Christ returns at the feet here of iron and clay, all of this, the traits of it will be smashed. The head of false religion, the head of world economy, the head of all the governments, everything that is anti-Christ, that is against you, church, that is against the godliness and righteousness of government in our nation, everything that is polluting us is going to be smashed when Christ returns. Amen. Amen. Notice this. Notice this. Daniel 2.35, that no place was found for them. Now, we haven't time to read it all at the moment. Write down in your book, if you're writing it, Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 is at, at the end of a millennium reign of Christ and the saints on the earth. Okay? And then there is the great white throne judgment. And John writes, notice he's opening up. He's opening it up and he says, And I beheld and know a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven was fled away. And there was found no place for them. He is bringing what Daniel was told. Now he said, now is the time is coming that the stone kingdom cut out, not cut out without hands, that's going to fill the whole earth. It's happening. Britain expanded with the commonwealth of nations. Britain expanded and there was South Africa. And then there was uh, also uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand and Canada. And then those who left, he shores to go to the United States. And then, of course, there, were, there was not only Britain and Ireland, but uh, there was also India was brought under the empire and so on and so on. Even this very week, we've had the Commonwealth Games, those whom we can trade with when we come out of Europe. And this is now the stone kingdom starting to spread. Not that they're all saved, but rather everywhere. Look, here's the truth about it, brothers and sisters. And I'm going to say it, and I don't mean it to hurt anybody or harm anybody. Everywhere the Union Jack went, the gospel went. Think about it. Think about it. Everywhere nationally the Union Jack went, the gospel went. Because even though I know there was many things that weren't right that happened, I know that. But yet the gospel went. It paved the way for men and women to go and preach about Christ. Now, I notice this. Notice this. In the great white throne, it says, was found no place for them. This is at the end time, yet Daniel sees it at the end when the stone comes and smashes the feet. Can you see that now? You see where you are now? Okay, stay with me. So the stone became a great mountain, speaking of Christ returning. Now, let's look at Daniel chapter 7. You may say we've done all of this. Yep, I'm rehearsing some of it, but I'm giving you also little other bits. There's so much I don't want to 
just throw it all in there where it ends up that it becomes a whole mishmash for you. I'm trying to do it on all sorts of levels here. Daniel 7, please. And let's just read verse 1. This is Daniel's dream now. This is not Nebuchadnezzar. This is Daniel's dream. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and the visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and, the sum, and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my visions by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea, and the four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Now notice four beasts coming up out of the sea. These are very important for next week. We're going to look at a beast with four heads coming up out of the sea. People tell you, oh, and when in the future there's going to be this big beast coming up with all these heads and all coming up out of the sea. My word. It's worse than Star Trek or something. <laughs> it's all explanatory in the Bible. The Bible interprets the Bible. And notice this. The four beasts came up out of the sea, diverse or different one from another. The first was a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings were plucked off. Thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man's, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, and like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. Notice the very metal here. Everything is very important. Great iron teeth it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Notice the horns. Ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in the horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. This is an artist's impression. Here's your kingdoms that I spoke of earlier, bringing us from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to Rome, papal Rome and the modern nations of Europe. But notice this. The Lord coming, destroying, the, this is the, representing the coming kingdom of Christ. This is what Daniel dreamt in relation. These are the kingdoms that Daniel dreamt in relation to these kingdoms. See, man sees himself always as good, doesn't he? Man says, I'm not a sinner. Man says, I don't need Christ. Man says, sure, I'm good anyway. Sure, God will let me into his kingdom. Man says, I'll get there by my own works or my alms or my deeds. Listen, you can only get there by grace through faith. Trusting in Christ alone, the precious blood. But notice this. So the first one is a lion. This lion represents the head of gold. We're going to look at that tonight. Next week, well, we might get a bit of this one done. But this is the main one we want to look at and spend the most of the rest of the night on it. Really because of this. Because the mystery Babylon religion is mentioned in Revelation chapter 17. And God willing, we'll look at it next week. Mystery Babylon the Great the mother of harlots, an abomination of the whole earth. And this is now in Revelation chapter 17, John writes, and it speaks of these kingdoms. This is the same kingdom, just seen differently. Man sees himself as great, but God sees himself as beasts, really, as, as those sinners. False religion. Can you see the difference now? Now, I notice this. Notice. And you excuse my voice, just about yesterday, and yesterday afternoon and then this morning and the praying and the preaching and the singing, I'm a little bit hoarse. Notice this, this lion, we want to, to look at it. The, the lion right down to the last beast, as we looked at last week, going right into uh, verse 8, there's horns and there's another little horn that comes up. So that little horn coming up here out of this one is related to here the iron and the clay of the feet here. These kingdoms are today. So this beast is in the earth today. The beast is the devil, but it's all the things that he is promoting is in the earth today. Now, uh, notice this here. There's a little horn comes up. We will look at it uh, more detail uh, next week. 
but uh, Andrew was good and he gave me uh, some uh, PowerPoints. I, I sent some photographs uh, to him. And we're going to look next week at, we're going to reverse back to these other kingdoms. There's the little horn that comes out of the other horns. Anybody know what that is? Who knows where that is? That's the Vatican. That's the little horn of the West. And then next week also we'll look at this one. Who knows where that is? Jerusalem. Who knows what that thing is there? That's the little horn of the East. Daniel speaks about it. And next week in God's will we will look at it. We're going to look at this next week. This is to do with the four heads of the beast coming out of the sea. Or off the leopard, pardon me. And then later with a, a beast we'll look at that. That was another map that I had. It just a little bit too squiggly. I didn't want to show that one on. So that will be in Daniel 8. We'll see that next week. Who knows where that is? Yeah. We have them both. Look, who knows where that is? This is all... Look, there's a euro coin. We'll look into these more next week. Woman riding the beast. The woman riding the beast. Look. There she's there. We'll look at her more next week. Oh dear, clothed in purple and scarlet. She's clothed in purple and scarlet. Oh, light side. Okay. <laughs> so we'll look at mo a lot of those next week. But what we want to look at tonight is this one here. Let me just get back to it. Is this one here, this beast here of a lion with wings. We're going to look at that, okay? So, uh, the lion with eagle's wings. Uh, just as gold is the most precious, the head of gold is the most precious of metals, as it were, the lion is the first among the, uh, the wild beasts of, if you want, the jungle or whatever, and it's known as the king of beasts. And, of course, the eagle is the chief of the birds of the air. Okay, so we have eagle's wings, and we have a lion. Will you turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 4? Jeremiah chapter 4. Now, while we're in Jeremiah chapter 4, I'm just going to pick out a little verse. And if you can picture this, way back before Judah is taken into Babylonian captivity, away before the dream, when they're still in Canaan land, Jeremiah is prophesying to the house of Judah. And Jeremiah is telling the house of Judah that God has had enough of their ways. Just one verse for time's sake, Jeremiah 4 and verse 7. Remember it was on apologetics and what it meant this morning? Well, here's a little bit of apologetics for you. Actually, most of this is apologetics in a way. Jeremiah chapter 4. Remember, he's speaking now to Jerusalem. He's speaking to the southern kingdom of Judah. The house of Israel are gone 120 years before. He says, the lion has come up from his thicket. And the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. God said there's a lion in the earth and he is coming to destroy Judah. He's coming, the destroyer of all the kingdoms, the ruler of all the kingdoms, the one that devours them all up. He says he's on his way. Turn from your wicked ways. Turn from your sinning, Judah. Turn back to God, they sing. Put things right. And they didn't, and the lion came. And the lion devoured Judah and Jerusalem and took them captivity, as we saw, into Babylon. Who was that lion? The Babylonian kingdom came. So is everyone with me here? See how the Bible interprets the Bible? You don't need, there's people who are trying to stick all sorts of things onto that. Oh, well, that could be some other empire that's coming and uh, uh, when all this, when everybody's secretly raptured away and all this. Listen, the Bible is telling you exactly what it wants you to know. So the Bible is saying that the destroyer is on his way. They didn't turn. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, you can look or listen. First Peter 5 and verse 8. Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. This, this satanic beast is on his way. He's roaring around. Now, spiritually, he's in the earth today, still doing the same. This satanic lion, he's still doing the same. 
He's called before God and he presents himself. I'll talk about that to you sometime. I don't believe it was in heaven. I'll talk about that in another time. I don't believe the devil was in heaven presenting himself before God. And I don't believe it was he was coming among all the angels. I believe it was the sons of God were on the earth. And he came like you present yourself before God. I'll talk about that another time. And the devil comes. And the Lord says, where are you, have you been? Where are you coming to? He says, I've been walking up and down in the earth and going to and fro in it. Peter takes this. And this destroying lion, this destroying lion, he, he takes Judah. So the scriptures are telling us, listen, if you're not saved, the destroyer, the lion is still out to take you, to destroy you. So really, Peter is looking back to the Old Testament scripture, and he's saying to those who had come to saving faith, keep going on with God and trust the Lord. And to those of you who don't know him, there is a roaring land roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. Give yourself fully unto God. Just like Jeremiah had preached to Judah in Judah, or Jer Jeremiah chapter 4. Can you see that now the resemblance? Can you see now really why these men of the scriptures are preaching these, these messages? And that's still, that scripture still relates to us today of this roaring lion. Look, just jot this down. We haven't time to go through it. But Ezekiel chapter 17 and verse 3 is known as Ezekiel's riddle. Let me teach you on that sometime as well. Uh, they, they think they disposed of, of the, the throne of David in the earth. And he says, well, the, the, the Babylonians, they, they come and they had taken, um, they, they had, they had taken um, Manasseh, not Manasseh, um, Zedekiah's sons, and they slayed his sons before his eyes, and then they put his eyes out and they took him away captive to Babylon. <laughs> oh, we have got rid of the, the throne of David on earth. No, they forgot. There were tender twigs still about. You know who the tender twig was? The daughters of the king. And Jeremiah takes them. And they end up in Ireland. And they marry Okaid, the harem, and the high king of Ireland. For he was from Judah, of the line of it. He was a pagan at this time. But Jeremiah knew where they were. And they ended up in the royal throne that sits in very London today. The whole lineage can be traced right back. So they didn't destroy the throne on the earth. God is in his throne. That is his footstool. Is it not that the whole, this nation then went around the earth and what I said earlier where the Union Jack went, the gospel went? Does it not make sense to you now? The greater plan of God on the earth? Now I notice this, Ezekiel 17 and 3. He speaks, he says, a great eagle with great wings, long-winged and full of feathers. Verse 12, he says, Know you not that these, what these things mean? Tell them, Behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem, and he hath taken the king thereof and the princes thereof and led them with him to Babylon. I told you what happened, but the first line of verse 3 says, A great eagle with wings took them. Now you see the lion that's coming. He has eagle's wings. Doesn't that make sense to you now? Thou art this head of gold, he says. That's your dream. But God's seen you as a lion coming, and he's seen the eagle's wings. Here's something else for you, a, a, a noteworthy point. While Babylon is represented here as a lion, so is the Lord Jesus Christ. So is the tribe of Judah. Uh, the representation was a lion. And while it seems that the, the powerful, ferocious lion of Babylon is lording over Judah's lion by taking them away captive to Babylon, looks like the devil is defeating Jesus, doesn't it? Looks like the, the devil is defeating Judah. But sure, it looked like that when he was hanging on the cross. And guess what? <laughs> it was all in God's plan. It was all in God's purpose. So you take heart for Second Chronicles 36 and verse 22. While they're in this kingdom, this kingdom then comes, and we'll look at it again, but this is the Medo-Persian kingdom that overtakes Babylon and 
uh, and, and disposers of the kings of Babylon, now the Medes and the Persians. They are a, a coalition government. We've heard enough of that too, haven't we? They're a coalition government. And you see, they have two arms. The two arms of the man is the coalition government, an inferior kingdom to the head of gold. When we look later at it, we see that it's a lopsided bear. This bear isn't a very good picture because he's meant to be either standing like this or like that. <laughs> I don't know which way. But he's a lopsided bear in the scripture. You know what that means? Because then Darius the Mede comes in, Cyrus the Persian overtakes him, and it becomes a lopsided kingdom. And guess what? Even in that little old Ulster, they're trying to do the same. Trying to do the same. Trying to overlord. They're trying to take away their rights. There's also three ribs in his mouth. I'll talk to you about that, God willing, next week. This is interesting, isn't it? You see it? It's interesting. Now, notice this. The ferocious land of Babylon seems like it's lording over Judah's lion. But listen to what it says in Second Chronicle 36 and verse 22. In this kingdom. See, between here and the carrying away of Judah, between here to these two kingdoms here, this is the same kingdom, remember? This is the same kingdom, just how man seen it, how God shows Daniel it. And this is the same kingdom here. See, between there, there's 70 years, right? 70 years. 70 years captivity. In that time, you write Psalm 137. We looked at it last week. By the rivers of Babylon, yeah, we sat down. He remembered when we wept when we remembered Zion. It's all in between these two here. Seventy years passes. But God had said through Jeremiah, when you go out in 70 years' time, he says, I'm bringing you back. I'm bringing you back. It's all in God's plan. Second Chronicles 36, 22. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. There's the Persian king overrides now even the Medo-Persian king. He's the, the lopsided, as it were. The kingdom becomes more powerful on one side. Verse 23, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build them a house where? In Jerusalem. God moved on a heathen king's heart, and he said to them, Now you let them go, for they're going to build a house for me in Jerusalem. But Lord, we took them out of there 70 years ago. I know I allowed it. But I'm telling you, and I let them go, 42,000 returned. 42,000 returned to Jerusalem. And then you'll read the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, rebuilding the temple and the walls, so rubble. You'll, uh, you'll read of Esther staying, as we looked last week. She stays, and you'll read of Esther and the Jews with Haman, looking to kill the Jews there, and, and Mordecai. Remember I told you last week, Mordecai was a Benjamite? Benjamin means son of my right hand, but he comes from the what? The light-bearing tribe. And there, even there, he is the light. He's the light there, and he says, listen, Esther, you've got to go and do this. The gospel is the light of the world. The apostle Paul and a lot of the uh, uh, early apostles, the disciples, were from the tribe of Benjamin, the light-bearing tribe. Okay. Let's go. There's a third noteworthy thing I want you to look at. The devil will try to mimic the things of God. The devil will try to mimic the things of God. For example, in John 1, verse 4 and verse 1, we're told, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, what the devil tries to mimic is, he then takes symbols that God has mentioned, and he tries to apply them to himself. That makes it look the part, the Lion of Judah. Now he comes as a lion. God said to Israel, I will bear thee up on eagle's wings. He has wings that come like, like an eagle. Can you see how he tries to mimic? Throughout religion, throughout time, he starts to mimic the reality of the things of God. It's like Janes and Jambres, that is the two priests of Egypt, who every time Moses done something, they mimicked after him. This is the whole theme coming right the whole way through this. I notice when, the, the, for example, the four faces in Ezekiel, 
that speak of the Lord. They actually are a type of Christ. Ezekiel 1 speaks of four faces, this, this being with four faces, one like a man, one like a lion, one like an ox, and one like an eagle. Do you know what they are? The man, the lion, the ox, and the eagle? They're the four encampments of Israel. For example, the man. In fact, they're on these banners. That's why they're here. There's the ox. That's meant to be the eagle. There. There's the man. There's the lion. They are the banner. They are the banner names of the encampment of Israel in the wilderness. There was the tabernacle in the wilderness. You had the, the eagle was down at the top with, with Asher and Naphtali. There's it there. So I were pointing you all the wrong direction. You just happen to be there. It's easier for me. I haven't got a PowerPoint. Three encampments, but the main encampment was a banner of Dan. It was an eagle. At the south, notice this is meant to represent God. When you're looking at it like this is it from a bird's eye point of view. Here we have Reuben. Reuben was at the south of the tabernacle here. And then you have Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. And then uh, uh, to the east, you had Judah. I can't see that from here. I can't remember who it is. Anyway, there we are. Who's those two? Shout those two names out for me, Colin, will you? Here and here. Sebulun and Issachar. And you know, the men of Issachar, they were actually men who looked at the signs of the times and were prophets of their day. Notice this. Ephraim. This is the northern kingdom represented that would later come at the tabernacle in the wilderness. Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh are Joseph's sons, so they represent Joseph. Strange enough, there's Benjamin. They were on the west side, yet it's Manasseh and Ephraim and the, representing the northern ten tribes who went westward. And yet they're on the west side of the tabernacle. Judah stays on the east, and they stay and go into Babylon and stay east. And of course, Dan representing northward, or God, the eagle. And man is Reuben. Reuben is the firstborn of sons of Jacob, who is Israel. And Reuben had the birthright. What happened? He gave it to who? To Ephraim. Give the birthright to Ephraim. God gave it to Ephraim. Why? Because Reuben defined his father's, his, his father's bed. So he lost his birthright. He was the eldest son. And went right down the line to Joseph's sons and says, I'm giving it to Ephraim. That's why the northern kingdom of Israel becomes known as Ephraim. So when you have this, notice Manasseh and Ephraim, they go and they become a commonwealth of nations or a company of nations and a great nation. Benjamin is the light-bearing tribe. That's the gospel tribe. And where did they go? They came west. Does that make sense? Because that's the western encampment. But here's the thing. In Ezekiel, he mentions these, representing the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is in these also because we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Christ is represented as the greatest servant of all, the great ox. He's represented as deity, almighty God in flesh in John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He's known as the great eagle. He, he, he is the man, the son of man, in the book of Luke. And then, of course, he's the lion, the king, the tribe of Judah, in the book of Matthew. All of it in the Old Testament, in the encampment of Israel. Jesus comes in John 15 and verse 1. And what does he say? I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Why is he the true vine? Because he means he is the true Israelite, because the vine represented the whole house. Does that make sense to people? It just all fits. It's, it, it takes us further into him. It's all about him. Everything foreshadows, pictures him. I'm tired of hearing about Antichrist. I'm more interested in the Lord Jesus Christ. More interested in it. So the devil comes and he uses these. He wants us to think these things. Listen, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 4, no, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And so they'll come with their big robes on in purple and scarlet. 
and they'll have their high, and in Anglican uh, Westminster too, they have their, their high hats on, you know. Do you ever see those hats? Do you know what they really are? They're called mitres. And if they look that way, it looks like a fish's mouth. Do you ever notice that? Because that's after Dagon, the fish mitre god. The fish man, half man, half fish. Remember Dagon was in the temple and they put the Ark of the Covenant beside it and Dagon ended up on his face? Do you remember that in the scripture? This is where all of this is coming from. The Dagon fish mitre. The very staff that they carry representing, especially the people with the keys on it, saying they have the keys of heaven and hell. Listen. The th- the, 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 the Pope in Rome does not sit on Peter's seat. That's right. Peter writes his last letters from where? From Babylon. The church at Babylon, he says, salutes thee. I don't know why people just don't read the word. The devil will try a land for a land and the Babylonian mysteries of the head of gold, this lamb with wings comes right down through those and we're going to look at those right into the book of Revelation next week. So make sure you get plenty out to see it and pray for me all week. Listen, the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, Paul writes, ordained before the world unto our glory. In verse 8 of 2 Corinthians 11, he writes, which none of the princes of this world knew, in the crucifixion of Christ, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The old devil, he isn't omniscient. He doesn't know everything. And he's not omnipresent. He is not everywhere. Some believers tend to think he's everywhere. He is not. And he is definitely not omnipotent. He is not all-powerful. There is only one almighty. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the almighty. That's what he said. Now, if you have two almighties, then one almighty on Almighty is himself, and so he's not an Almighty anymore. <laughs> there can only be one Almighty, one sovereign Lord God of heaven and earth, and all things are done according to his will and to his glorious and wonderful purpose. <laughs> this great plan of the ages of Israel gathering in the West. Look, you know me. I believe we are descended of those people. Lost as a goose in a storm now. And the gospel came to us that we would hear of salvation by grace through faith and carry the gospel to all the world. To all the world. And when Christ returns, we will rise to meet him in the air and reign with him. What happens is it becomes the worship of idols in the place of the worship of Christ. It becomes ritual in the place of reverence. It becomes religion in the place of relationship. It becomes another spirit instead of or in the place of the Holy Spirit, like the Kundalini spirit. You must be careful of these things. Looks the part. Looks the part. But it's got nothing to do with God. Nothing to do with God. It becomes mystery meditation instead of meditation through revelation of the Word of God. It becomes worldly adaptation in the place of scriptural application. And it becomes man's ecumenical new world order, one world government, rather than humbling themselves to be ready for the true and the real new world order, one world government that is coming, the stone kingdom. When Christ comes, he's going to smash the whole lot. 
He's going to come and smash the whole lot. Listen, church, don't you be discouraged. People are saying, oh, the church is dying. That's impossible. Jesus says, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus said that. You know what? I believe him. I believe him. Time's gone. Let me finish with this. John tells us that this spirit of Antichrist manifests in the hearts and minds of men and women and also in the heads of religious orders. This spirit of Antichrist is mentioned. You can write these down just for time's sake. 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 22. 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. And 2 John chapter 1 and verse 7. Listen to what he says in this scripture. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. I've said this before, said again, I'm not trying to offend anyone. I don't care who you are. If you deny that Jesus Christ is God, you're an antichrist. That's what it means. Islam professing Isis, the Isis that they say is Jesus has nothing to do with our Jesus. The Isis or the Isis that they say who is Jesus never died on their cross on a cross. He never rose then from the dead. He is not Almighty God clothed in flesh. He is not the Son of God and the Son of Man to them. He is merely a prophet at the most. It's the spirit of Antichrist. Listen, Judaism, deny Christ. It's the spirit of Antichrist. Jehovah's Witness or Russellism, the Russellites. Really, we are Jehovah's Witnesses in the sense where we witness for the true, one, true living God. They deny the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a spirit of Antichrist. Even Mormonism, Mormonism say that Jesus and Satan and Adam are all brothers. Satan came and tempted Adam, two gods fighting, as it were, on the earth, two, and Jesus came to fix it. They don't tell you that when they wrap the door with her, with her Colgate smile. <laughs> Unitarianism, Unitarian Presbyterianism. It means anything not only in the place or denying Christ as an antichrist, anything in the place of Christ as antichrist. You know what that tells me? There's a man that sits in Rome and he says, I am the vicar of Christ. He is worshipped as Christ on earth, as God on earth, and as antichrist. Don't be afraid to let people know it. In these day and age, you were told, no, 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 you can't say that. The scriptures still stand and it still remains the truth today. And any man, any woman, from anywhere, any religion who says Jesus Christ is not the only true wise God in the flesh, any of them, the Scripture says, they're an antichrist. They're an antichrist. They are a deceiver. They're a seducer. See the word deceiver, by the way? The time's gone. He'll give me another five minutes. All right, for five more minutes, okay. John says, for many deceivers are entered into the world. These deceivers are antichrist. Listen to what he says. This word deceiver is the word planos, and it means seducing one. They seduce you. Hello, I'm Elder Davidson, and I just come from the States to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ. They've nicer teeth than me. We believe in Jesus. Next thing, they pull out another gospel of Jesus Christ. That's one of their books. Another gospel. And Paul says, if any man come preaching another gospel. And they hand it up. Notice it says, another gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't get any more blatant. That actually says it right in the front cover. 
brothers and sisters, come on, church. That's waking up. There's men, there's men in church, I know there's none of ours here now, but just so as I don't get an R thumping on the way, uh, thump, not another one, a eh? thumping on the way to the door. <laughs> there's men and they've got spines like a wet noodle. And they can't stand up for themselves even if they tried. Christian men, pastors, preachers, and have backbones carved out of soft banana. <laughs> They're afraid. Oh, but if this says or that says and we're not politically correct, so you'll just believe the God of Marxism and let it carry our children into a devil's hell. If I say anything, my boss might be give off to me and work. Well, tell him about them too or her. Let us not be afraid. Neither let us be ashamed of the one who bought us his precious blood. Oh, I have so much here. I'm just trying to find out where to stop. Here is, here is church history. Now, church history, we know the church in the wilderness and the tabernacle. We know the church as we know it, the ecclesia, the called out of our nation, you and I. Church history is just around about there. Actually, it's about here. Some, well, maybe up just above there. Somewhere along there, okay? Down to here. Here it is in a paragraph. At Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the church was formed. Then years later, through the papacy, it was deformed. Then came the reformers and they reformed the church. Then in modern years coming up, we had the modernism that says Jesus could never have walked on water. He paddled in the shallows. That it must have been some explanation for him feeding the 5,000 with the five body loaves and the two small fish. They expl- this, these are ministers, not like Protestant ministers, explaining away the gospel to make it acceptable to those who are thinkers. What about those who are touched by the Holy Ghost? Through the modernists, it was conformed. So it was formed, deformed, reformed, not conformed. That's where the church is today. It's conforming to the world. It's conforming to the things that we're told to do and say, how to say it and how to do it. Do you know what the church needs today? People say, no, a reformation. No, we've got the truth. It needs a transformation. It needs transformed. Be transformed by the renewing off your mind. No longer, no longer are we going to let this happen and stand. We're going to stand for the things of God. To be conformed, we'll look at it maybe next week. Here's what we'll look at next week. We're going to go into this beast, because remember, this all runs right down. This runs right down. Notice, this is a bear, this is a leopard, this is indescribable, so they've just drawn something. That's what's happening today. That's how much has came around the world. It's indescribable. The beast takes many fashions and forms. We're going to look at all of these, God willing. We might need one more week, but this is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 13. Read it when you go home or during the week. Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 17. And we'll look at Revelation chapter 19. Because in Revelation chapter 17, we have the fall of mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots. Revelation chapter 18, we have the further uh, desolation of her. And then in Revelation chapter 19, it concludes with her fall. Revelation 17 is the ecclesiastical fall. Revelation chapter 18 is the economic fall. And Revelation chapter 19... My brain's going now. Revelation chapter 19 is the governmental fall or the, the, very, uh, uh, the very new world order fall. Yeah. And then Revelation chapter 19, what happens? You'll read about it in Revelation chapter 19. Oop. This happens. The kingdom of Christ. John sees him sitting, as it were, on a white horse. Now, it's not King Billy. (laughs) 
His horse wasn't weighed anyway. But anyway, John sees him sitting on a, the Lord sitting on a white horse. Down his thighs written the word of God. The beginning was the word. And he comes to smash all of this ungodliness that we are living in. To set up his wonderful kingdom Amen. upon the earth. Amen.